Welcome to my latest experiment. This is a big one, the one I've been waiting for all my life. What is it? Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Oh my god. The queen will rise to the top. Oh yeah. And I am the voice of the voiceless. And there is no one that does it better. The Guy and Harley podcast. Streaming all over your face. Perhaps that was the most important part. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Pigville on the internet. Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis. Man, when I was dead broke, I couldn't picture this. Welcome to the Guy and Harley podcast. I am Guy Pigden. And I'm Harley Neville. And uh, welcome to episode three. Um, we've got a lot to talk about today. We've got a lot of interesting topics, if you like filmmaking. If you don't... Tune out now. Fuck you. No, don't tune out. I'm sure we'll have all sorts we'll of have interesting many, insights. We'll have many other things, I'm sure, to talk about. In Six. fact... Well, what? <laughs> just guessing. Um, I, in fact, I just wanted to uh, chime in to begin with. Um, we're on iTunes now. We, ha- we We haven't put the link up yet. Uh, because we're still trying to figure out how to fix out all our spelling, mis- uh, well, f- <laughs> our spelling mistakes and stuff, um, which make us look quite amateurish and stupid. Mm. My spelling mistakes, um, and but we are up on iTunes. So if you're a iTunes uh, listener, <laughs> if you're one of the everybody that is an iTunes listener, then you'll be able to download our podcast shortly. Imagine that; it will just be sitting on your iPod. Lucky you! Yeah. <laughs> you can just hear us whenever you want. When you're at the gym, <laughs> when you're touching yourself, <laughs> when, when you're driving down the road, we'll be there with you. Um, but part of the uh, the way that you get onto iTunes is that they basically have to listen to your podcast. Really? Yeah. So, like, so there's a professional podcast listener down at iTunes. That's correct. It's a troll through all of this crap. Every podcast that comes in has to be screened for like... Every episode or every No, I basically, series. What, basically what happens is they listen to one or two and they're like, yeah, all yeah, right. Put him up. Yeah, he's not crazy. So we made the cut. So we made the cut, but I just think it's funny that there's a professional iTunes listener having to troll through the absolute dog shit of the podcast world, including us. <laughs> well, you know what? That's probably just the job that this guy does from home. He's pro- they probably just contract it out to people. Like, you know, you just l- listen to these uh, shitty podcasts while you're going to the gym and, and you give it the yay or the nay. And oh, you get yeah. paid per podcast or something like that. So. I, I, I would imagine so, but like it's it would just be so soul destroying because most podcasts aren't good. Yeah, but you'd probably be able to figure that out within the first five minutes. Yeah, but I think you still have to listen through. Like, I don't think that you can just, like, listen to a bit because you have to check that there's no sort of um, content that would be, like... Uh, like hate speech or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, and also sort of from a legal standpoint, like, they're not playing, like, top radio hits for right. half the half the thing. Yeah, although that's automated, I'm sure. Uh, like, on YouTube, yeah. you'll be able to, um, you know, they'll have some sort of program that will, Probably. Uh, you know, pick up on uh, copywritten material. Yeah, but anyway, I just thought it was kind of like your job as the professional television watcher that yep. you were uh, yep. previously. Yeah, I used to be a broadcast media exchange operator, so my job was literally to watch TV 40 hours a week. I just had to sit there and just watch TV, just full seasons of things. To, to make sure there's no mistakes. To make sure there's no technical faults, so, so glitches and so on. It sounds great until you consider the fact that I had to watch everything, so uh, religious programming, infomercials, mm. uh, season upon season of Real Housewives, <laughs> you know, The Bachelor, uh, The Block. Well, well, that's the thing, because you know what you'd quickly realise is, like, you know, although we're in this golden era of television, one, New Zealand's not playing that golden era, <laughs> no, well, I wasn't watching Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad, <laughs> so so that's not really what you're watching. To actually, the like good show to bad show ratio is still probably ninety percent bad shows. Oh, oh so, maybe even more. So you're literally spending. I was you know, watching thirty five hours watching 
at the worst also, things. Like, kids shows as well, like, you know, <laughs> like just these terrible like anime sort of, you know, shows that were really just um, designed to uh, sell toys, you yeah. know, they weren't real shows in their own right. They yeah. were kind of just like, yeah, these big inf- big infomercials for these silly toys. <laughs> so I'd sit there and watch them all. But anyway, dear iTunes uh, listener, uh, thank you for putting us on. Yes. We appreciate that. You've stopped listening. You're not listening to this one where we thank you, but just to know that we spared a thought for you and your struggles, and we're very sorry. Um, so, first on the agenda. Yep. Uh, now, recently, or I guess uh, a couple of weeks ago now, or 16 days ago, um, new Kickstarter campaign started for what we do in the shadows. Mm-hmm. Now, what we do in the shadows is by uh, Taika Waititi's and Jermaine Clement, uh-huh. and um, it was an incredibly successful New Zealand vampire mockumentary comedy. Yep, uh, I went to see it. It was very good. Really enjoyed it. Uh, made about two point five million dollars uh, theatrically in New Zealand, which was the highest grossing New Zealand film of the year uh, by quite a margin. Uh, so, you know, rave reviews, uh, everyone loved it, um, you know, it did very well. And basically this new Kickstarter, uh, is they want $400,000, um, trying to... I reckon re- Jermaine's probably got that in his bank, man. Or have they both got that in their bank? But, uh, I digress. <laughs> um, yeah, $400,000 to basically release, not release the film, that would, that's incorrect to take the film to more cinemas in America. So essentially, they're asking their fans to pay for um, the film to go to more cinemas. To have a wider release. Exactly. In the States. Yes, and one that they are sort of more in control of uh, than they would otherwise be. Now, um, well, I mean, I'd like to preface this by saying I love those guys Mm -hmm. i i think they're some of the most inspiring people i think boy is one of my favorite new zealand films of all time i think flight of the concords is uh an exceptional comedy and you know will be an exceptional comedy in, in 10 or 20 years and i think and like you know i just i love seeing all that stuff so i would certainly count myself as a as a big fan however I, I do not personally agree with this move, um, and I'll go into that in a second, but I'll throw it over to you. What do you think of it? Uh, what what do you think? Do you think that's a, like? Do you think that they should be asking for this money to do this thing? Oh uh, yeah, well I think that uh, I think it's really just good producing, isn't it? It's just smart ball. Like when when you look back, uh, when history looks back on them, it's going to be like, oh well, the film had a release in the states, but the but they are so ambitious that they were not happy with that release. They decided that they were going to rustle up some more money to get their film, which they obviously v- really believe in, seen by as many people as possible. And the way they did that was they turned to crowdsourcing and uh you know it worked or i assume it's working um Mm. you know and so so i think that uh sure they're not exactly what kickstarter kickstarter is designed for which is sort of you know uh, well i think of it as something for up and coming people to uh get funding in a way that they never could before you know and I, i don't think it's uh so great when people who are already established are using it um right which is what is happening here which is kind of what is happening here but I also think that you know you can't you can't fault them you know you got to admire their uh, drive and determination there they're getting it done and uh, as a result their film is going to be seen by a lot more people and probably this is going to pay off. Well, I I disagree with the, that that point that a lot more people are going to see their film. I don't think that's true. I think about the same number of people are going to see their film. I just think that more people are going to see it in the cinema as opposed to how they were going to see it, uh, which was. Uh, digitally on uh, you know online which right. was would have been the more the video on demand which they'll still be doing of course over there yeah um but you know my i guess my issues with it are that oh, this already happened i might add is um Tyker did this with boy yeah. he asked for a hundred thousand dollars to uh release do it a limited release in new zealand uh not in new zealand sorry in america um 
uh, theatrical thing, and it kind of blew up in his face a little bit. Well, didn't the same thing happen with Zach Braff? Um, he did the same well, thing. Well, that's a little bit different because he was asking for money to fund his film. Right. Uh, it did blow. I mean, I mean again, there was, there was some negative, negative feedback. feedback. But what happened with the Taika one was that he uh, asked for this money and promised all the stuff and then didn't deliver on all the stuff that he promised in a very timely manner because he kind of over promised on all those things and so yeah. he had to do all these things which took way longer than he thought and yeah. and also i don't really think that screen like you know that that limited release did anything so it was kind of a bit of a waste and he did say he was never going to do another kickstarter after that yeah which is now been proven yeah. to be not true <laughs> yeah but i think the issue that i have with this is um that you know, there's a time to ask for your fans to to give you money and support you, and there's a time to co- not. And you know, I think that if what we do in the shadows, they they couldn't get funding from anywhere. You know, no one was going to give them a shot. And then they turned to the fans and said, "Hey, we really want to make this film. You know us. You know our work. You know, help make it happen." That is entirely, you know, fine. And and you know, and I also think that you got to rely on your fans to to show up to these films, which everyone did. Um, but I think it is not appropriate to kind of ask your fans to go, "Hey, look, um, the film's going to be released in America. Everyone in America can see this film already, but we just want it to be uh, come in a specific way to Americans." Well, they want it to be seen in the best possible way, which is in cinemas, which is the way that it's going to be the best received people are going to enjoy it more with that surround well, sound and that big screen and that sort of community yes. feel that you get when you go to a cinema but again having said that no one was saying that the film wouldn't have a theatrical release over there it's just having more of a theatrical release which is maybe unnecessary because maybe there wouldn't be that demand for it necessarily you know um because it would be a sort of a, a normally a limited release and then they would probably if there was demand it would keep playing and if there wasn't they wouldn't um and this is kind of you know just bypassing all of that but i just think that like asking the fans to pay for you to do extra distribution when you already have distribution when people that really might need that money for legitimate like they don't have distribution so they're going to independently distribute something. Well, they need $400,000. Being backed by a distributor already and then asking for $400,000 on top of that, I don't think is uh, is right in my personal opinion. Well, I don't know. I feel like um, I feel like people giving their money to what we do in the shadows doesn't mean that they're not giving money to other people. You know, like nobody's missing out really. And these people that are giving their money are choosing to give their money. And, you know... If they didn't give it to what we do in the shadows, they wouldn't necessarily give it to uh, older or uh, no. any other. Film. I guess I just think it's a bit misleading because what they're saying is like we need this, you know, yeah. we need this to you know help make it happen for us, and it's like it's happened. You made it. You've cracked it's a, it. It's a, it's a, awesome. It's amazing, and it's incredibly successful, and it's been successful everywhere. And you've got all the things you really want. You just don't have this one sort of small element of a thing. And then you're asking everyone to kind of give you cash to do that. Mm. Um, and that, I guess, is is, is where I um, uh, did sort of don't really agree with it. Well, I don't know, man. I think if I survived a zombie holocaust, it <laughs> takes off real big. And then someone <laughs> sort of comes up to us and says, hey, why don't we do a Kickstarter to get it in a few more cinemas? I don't know. I don't know if we'd be able to say, no, that's a shit idea. I couldn't do it. I couldn't, do it. I couldn't sleep at night. That's the thing, though. There's a very drastic difference between... <laughs> our yeah. film and 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 okay, but say it was a big success well if it was a big it's su- not out yet we don't know yeah i guess if it was a big success that would uh i that would muddy the waters a bit but i'm not sure that i would want i I'd would be pref- like, i'd be like let's go bro let's go on kickstarter to be honest i'd i'd take four hundred thousand dollars for the next <laughs> thing i wouldn't be worried right. about uh you know if the zombie film was doing well already yeah. i think it would be i think it's, that's the thing about it is what we would need it for was to independently distribute because we couldn't secure the kind of support and distribution that they had um and and therefore would i would feel be more valid Mm -hmm. um t-shirt and autographed dvd 105 bucks Mm mm-hmm well, that's right, though, isn't it? Because, um, you know, a T-shirt you pay 60 bucks for and a DVD, but you pay 40 bucks for. Well, I'll go back there and say I pay 
10 to 20 dollars for my dvds and save for my t-shirts yeah, yeah. <laughs> if i can possibly but like I, I was looking at a t-shirt the other day for a band i really like called yeah. uh enter shikari right and it was like i think it was 60 or or maybe even 70 dollars to order it online yeah um you know, and I was like, I was like shit, son. That's, that's how much T-shirts are these days. You know? Well, no, it's not. It's when they're rip off. I want to support the band. You know, <laughs> when, when they're when it's a bit of a rip off, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that much. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, movie uh, movie T-shirts and band T-shirts, two different entities. Like mm. a band T-shirt is cool. Yeah. Uh, a movie T-shirt is kind of just advertising for the. For the movie, yeah. usually, you know, unless it's an iconic film, yes. you know, yeah, yeah, and, you're yeah. Do, and you're wearing it like in a retro way or a tongue in cheek kind of way, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, if it's a film, if someone was walking around with an Avengers shirt, I yeah. wouldn't be like, cool, man, you're awesome. Well, no, <laughs> <laughs> I have an Avengers shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm never like, cool, man, you're awesome. <laughs> someone bought me that for Christmas. Right. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry to whoever it was that bought you that. <laughs> my mum. <laughs> no, no, I think it was my uh, brother-in-law, maybe, right. or, or my sister. Sorry, sorry bro. Um, but yeah, well, so you say you vote yay on the Kickstarter, I vote nay. Yeah, I say power to them. I say like, you know, the internet's there to be used and if you can get 400k out of the internet, you know, why not? Like, why not use that power that you have, that sway and influence you have ah, to get for- that and to give your film the greatest opportunity you can. Save it for I, the I think next one. I would do. Save it for the next one, man. Yeah, but there's more money out there. <laughs> there's plenty of internet to go around, you know, the next film they'll do the same shit. I guess I think my concern is that you know, those types of things will kind of, because, you know, Kickstarter and Indiegogo are new yeah, the ideas. Yeah, the bubble might exactly, burst. Exactly, and I'm worried about them bursting the bubble. Exactly. They might they might burst the bubble, but if they don't, someone else will. And, you know, like <laughs> I'd rather that be us. <laughs> it, it is going to burst that bubble, probably. Probably. People are going to stop giving a shit. People are going to stop yeah. donating their money, maybe, you know? But that's what I think. Or it might that, become really commonplace. Well, I think that people won't as long as these types of Kickstarters yeah. don't happen. And yeah. it's, and it, if it, you know... Uh, so why it's really important if you're doing a Kickstarter to make sure that you come through on on all your promises and you know the things that you say you will give your perks. Speaking you know? of which, uh, yeah. we're working on the older posters, guys. Yeah, if people are listening. <laughs> we are working on those. Perks. We just got to pay to make get them made and sent away. But it's coming. It's on the way. It's on the way. It's on um, the to do list. Okay. Well, uh, the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is editing. Okay, oh, this is going to be thrilling, no doubt. Um, Enlighten me. <laughs> because I have been editing a lot. Yeah. And I read uh, a sort of, basically a, um, uh, it was basically an article by an editor. And he's like, advice to the directors from an editor. And I'm an editor. I edit my own things. So mm-hmm. I, I was like, is this advice good? Um, one of the things he said is like, either get them people to slow it down or speed it up as in the performances yeah so like slow it down so that the editor can decide the rhythm of the performance as opposed to the actor because if the actor is overlapping lines Mm -hmm. and talking at a certain speed then um you get into the situation where they've dictated the rhythm so if things aren't going right so if there's big gap or if there's gaps between the lines the editor can trim those up but if there's no gaps between the lines the uh the editor is is forced. bound by that yeah. uh, pace. Yeah. But the other thing that he said was um, speed it up, which mm. was that every single time you see performances, they're always slow, like in the edit. Yeah. Like they're always a bit slow. And on set, it would be better to say just like everyone do everything faster. You think that you're going at a normal pace, but right now, you know, you're pausing for your acting looks and you're doing this and you're mm. doing that and you're actually going at a much slower pace than what the cut will decide at the end um and those kind of two although they're a bit contradictory kind of valid completely conflict well that's what he said but you know that's what i'm saying so he's basically saying like leave like don't be overlapping like leave gaps in Mm -hmm. the performances but as the performance overhaul as a whole make sure that it's quick and snappy and if you think that you're doing it fast you're probably not yeah um he also said that don't faff around with wide shots is like don't do seven eight nine wide shots yeah. and then get a couple of close-ups because yeah. well that makes sense yeah and he, and he did make a good point where he said that in a wide shot you have to get a lot more right because not only do you have to get the actor's performance but you also they have to get 
the 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 body of their performance the actual body working mm-hmm. in the same way as opposed to just their face and then on top of that you have the set has to look right and everything has to be more and enhanced for a wide to work mm-hmm. in a way that a close-up you know it's only the actor's face that has to be delivering whereas you know the entire set and crew have to be delivering in a wide which i thought was yeah again pretty solid mm-hmm. pretty solid advice but what's his his hip basically he's saying don't bother with too many wides because you're not going to use the wide too much anyway and you know when you cut wide uh you're not necessarily seeing uh the faces and the the dialogue that close anyway you can kind of cut wide and then cut back in and get away with not yeah uh, it was well, saying a, a wide is harder to get right yeah and from an editor's point of view you like you don't really wides aren't you always want to jump into the close-ups right. to really, you know, get to the meat of the story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I thought uh, that was interesting. Um, but he was also, like, in terms of... Because co- I've had this argument many times, shooting coverage. How much coverage do you shoot? Are you over-covered or under-covered? Coverage is just how many shots you use to do a scene. Yeah. Um, and I prefer to do slightly probably less coverage but more takes um because i think that so the coverage is the angles you're using yes whereas takes is the amount of times you do it yes the the angles you choose to to, to yes um i mean ideally you get to do both yeah you know when i first started out i was like look fuck coverage okay i'm just gonna storyboard and i'm just gonna storyboard each specific shot and that's all we're gonna use and that's all we need because i've got the vision in my mind and as soon as i started editing I realized that that was a terrible way yeah. to do things yeah. because the thing is, I think what people don't really understand about filmmaking is you don't know that you got it right when you're doing it. You have an instinct and you have a feeling and you can say, look, this feels good and it seems okay. And I think we've got it. I think we've got it, but you don't know because by the time when you actually, cause you're only shooting this one tiny piece. What is it going to look like when all the other pieces are lined up next to it? And, you know, how is it going to feel? And how is it going to feel opposite the other actor's performance that you shot in another piece? And how is it going to feel to the story overall and the tone? And, you know, for example, you know, you get someone to do something quite humorously and then it just doesn't play. He mm. needed to do it a bit straighter. He needed to do a bit more serious. But at the time, you were, you, you were sure it was going to be the funny version yeah. that you used. And this is sometimes seen as like indecision for, for a director or, you know, why are we doing this so many times? Why are we doing this so much? And it's like, because, you know, those performances are the, are the key thing. And you just, you, the actor has an idea of how it should be. Me, the director has an idea of how it should be. Um, and, but neither of those are necessarily going to be exactly right. Um, and certainly so you want to have the option exactly so you've got to have those options so you can massage that and shape that because at the end that that edit is your sort of final rewrite yeah um and i think that is a very important thing for sort of young filmmakers to take away is like you know the more time you have yeah shoot more do more but you know concentrate on the performances but do not just have one specific set way you know have your idea and then throw a few um deviations in there and try a few things because you're inevitably going to wind up using that stuff mm-hmm. um and and so yeah that was just uh because i've been editing uh older older which is our second feature film and it is quite i don't really love editing but i do find it addictive in the sense that you know you put a piece together and then you've got that piece you've done it it's there you can see it you can see what you shot on the day it's quite a rewarding experience in a way that a lot of the other parts of filmmaking aren't because you don't see what you've done yeah um you know when you've written something yeah you've written it but so what you've got to film it you've got to do all this stuff it's got to happen but when it's cut that's kind of getting towards that final part and you're like okay yeah yeah um but uh, you know what for me what i think is like films are like a puzzle within a puzzle within a puzzle and like every single element is another puzzle so for instance the camera where do you put the camera why where what should it be use? yeah uh and then it's like the performance what's the right performance for this moment why how do we get it right uh and then you know the edit how long do we stay on the shot you know and then the music how 
noticeable is it what kind of emotion do you want to evoke and like if you think about films as like a rubik's cube uh you're trying to because every single thing is one tiny little piece and you're trying to get all those pieces to come together all at once which is near to impossible so if you think about the greatest films in history if you looked at them as a rubik's cube it'd be all uniform colors every side perfect and that's what makes them great what makes what you normally see in like good films or lesser films is like yeah you can see that they made the rubik's cube but there's a couple of colors out just here and there just where they kind of fucked up along the way and they just didn't quite get it right and it is so difficult to you know get that you know perfect and and when i say perfect i mean don't mean like the perfect film exactly but just like every single element of every single part of the filmmaking process done correctly and not in any way uh taking away from the experience Mm -hmm. did you make up that rubik's cube analogy yeah this is pretty good it's pretty good (laughs) hats off to you thank you nice yeah yeah Uh, i've got a question for you so um uh, I think a lot of people will probably check out Pigville uh, and they'll see some dick and fart jokes sure. and kind of think, like, <laughs> yes. these guys just fucking around. <laughs> yes, you know, we, yeah. what are these guys are a couple of bumbling idiots that just <laughs> well, dicking around. Would they say idiots? <laughs> I mean, they won't. No, you know, like, they don't, might not take it very seriously. But actually, uh, there's actually a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes uh, on all of this stuff. And uh, Guy has a, a very... Um, strong work ethic and uh, I thought maybe uh, you, I wanted to ask about your um, your routine which okay. is actually quite uh, <laughs> yes. a- outlandish <laughs> yeah. um, you know Guy sleeps in four hour blocks now this yes. is not a joke Guy you know you might, he, he lives and breathes these dick and fart jokes you know like he, he, wor- he sleeps in four hour blocks <laughs> yeah. so that he can like sometimes he goes to bed at like 10pm and gets up at like 4am or what, some ridiculous time in the morning yeah. and then does editing it goes editing for X amount of hours and then hits the gym and then goes to sleep for a while, then goes to work because yeah. you've got to pay the bills, right? Like, you know, got to, got to, got to <laughs> yes. pay the, the electricity and, uh, and then, and then does it all again the next day. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, tell so us a little bit about that. Well, my routine is, and you know, look, it goes through extreme sometimes, you know, I, I will say that like, you know, it ebbs and flows and sometimes you're working very, very hard and other times, you know, there's always a constant state of you're doing, or oh, I'm doing quite a lot, but you know, that will kind of escalate to craziness sometimes. But yes, what I find is because I work 44 hours a week in my other work. Um, which is in the evenings. Um, normally graveyard shifts. Normally ten p.m. till uh, six a.m. So what I'll do is I'll I'll go to work, and I also I often frequently I will cut do a little bit of editing on my when I'm working or a little bit of writing. So in that sense, he's a professional editor. Um, or a little bit of um, prepping, whether it's like uh, writing emails or festivals. What is your, what is your day job there? Day job I work as a uh, alarm night job. night job, alarm monitoring. So you're basically monitoring alarms on a computer. Alarm comes in, you call up someone, you go, hey, your alarm's gone off, do you want us to send a guard? Um, that type of thing. So it's, it's nothing to do with the film industry or anything like that. It's just a Not pay at the all. bills. Yep. And, you know, of course, in the night shift, like although that's when all the robberies happen um, or burglaries, uh, it's it gets quiet at certain times, which means that you have these sort of windows. See, even burglars have got to sleep, right? Yeah. And or plot the next burglary. Yeah. And also, <laughs> interesting aside, uh, less crime when there's rain. Is that true? That's what I, so I saw a policeman say that once. See, there was less crime when it's raining. Like on a nice day, the burglars are like, let's go out Robin. Mm. But on the rainy days, you're like, fuck it, we'll stay inside and watch Game of Thrones. Yeah. On this new big plasma TV I've got. Well, I will say <laughs> that the burglaries also seem to take place between the most popular, I think, is between 4 and 6 a.m. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so in, in the early morning. So yeah. they do have a sleep and yeah. then they get up and go do the burglary. Well, hey, you know, burgling ain't easy, man. <laughs> you know, like, it's a job. Like, everyone, everyone's everyone got a job, man. I bet they're like, fuck getting up at this time. God, i got to get a different job. I know, pretty much. <laughs> sneak it around <laughs> but yeah anyway so i um i i, I do my job to so i finish at 6 a.m then i normally go to the gym uh and then i sometimes i'll do a little bit of editing before i go to bed sometimes i'll have uh uh um, um uh have to do some like i'll have to go to a post-production suite so that will be for the grade or a sound mix or something so what i'll do is i'll sleep for a couple of hours 
uh, then I will go and do like nine to five or 10 to five at wherever this post-production place is supervising that. Uh, then I'll have like a three hour sort of nap and then I'll go back to work. And then on my days off, I'll sort of, sometimes I'll like on my first day off, I'll like just stay up. So, you know, I finish at 6am and then I kind of just stay up the whole day <laughs> doing stuff. Mm-hmm. And then like, so essentially miss a day's sleep. And then start like sort of sleeping in the night. But I also find that, yeah, do my four hour sleep block. I'll wake up feeling quite energized. So I'll frequently I'll, I'll work till like, you know, three or four or maybe even like eight in the evening. And then I'll have a nap and then I'll wake up at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And then I'll start working again. Um, start working editing, being editing. Editing, yeah, yeah yep. editing or, or, or whatever or that sort of thing. So, you know, it's it's not easy, man. No, well, it's a full time grind. And, um, yeah, I'm very lucky to be riding on your coattails. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that, you know, I think, I guess that is a thing that, like, a young filmmaker, even myself, didn't really think about, is this, like, look, man, filmmaking, that's rarefied air, you know, you don't uh, just, like, that is a 1% job, you know, you know, 99% of people want to do, like, they imagine, like, oh, yeah, I'd just love to be an actor, I'd just love yeah. to direct films, I'd just love to do something arty and cool and, you know, uh, creative, just really fulfill my creative, uh, you know, needs and, 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 and ambitions, you Tell know. Tell the world about my ideas. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that, you know, like, which is uh, fine, um except that you know what you quickly find is one if everyone wants to do something well you're gonna have to work harder than everyone Mm. if you want to do it Mm. uh two you know like to get to the point where you know you're making films you're getting paid well and all that stuff you're gonna have to uh you know no one's just gonna like filmmaking is not a job where you go to film school and then they go congratulations you got your film degree you're now a doctor of film and you direct films and you're a filmmaker and we pay you heaps of money you know what happens is you'd finish film school or you don't and no no one gives a fuck no one gives a flying fuck about you that you are just a piece of shit like you were before you started that yeah. <laughs> and and so not to disenchant <laughs> not, not to disenchant you at all well, it's <laughs> true so then you you kind of have to pull you yourself up by your own bootstraps and go okay well i have to now have a normal job and be a normal person but at the same time do full time towards my other goal my my dream and 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 you know because that's the thing as well is is it is incredibly time consuming filmmaking is one of the most time consuming uh jobs if if you're embracing like all elements of it that there really is because just everything it takes a long time to write things it takes a long time to plan to shoot those things it you know when you're filming it's 12 hour days and then when you're editing it takes a very long time and all of those things are just you know hundreds and hundreds of hours yeah that was one of the things that i you know really struggled with sort of coming to terms with was you know when i was younger i was really enthusiastic because i was like yep like so we'll make a film and it'll be (laughs) it'll be art and it'll be amazing and then everyone will like it and uh we'll move on to the next one right you know and then (laughs) and then it was like you know oh actually even just the pre-production you know takes quite a lot a long time to organize things before you actually get to that shooting stage then you're shooting it's long arduous days yeah then you finish that and you know like i used to be like oh well it's all shot now so i can't wait till this comes out and i'd always be thinking about it i remember for like literally you know i mean i was thinking like after the zombie film came out i was like oh sorry after the zombie film was shot i was like sweet so it'll be out soon yeah you know it's still not out it's four years later Uh, yeah Um, you know and it's like at some point between then and now i kind of came to grips with this idea that it'll be out when it's fucking out and just stop thinking about it. Yeah. And it, I actually get a little bit grumpy when people ask me, hey, so so when's the film out? You know, I'm like, it's out when it's fucking out, man. You just fucking leave me alone. <laughs> you shut up. <laughs> what do you care? <laughs> yeah, well, I think, yeah, that is the big revelation. And I think also it's, it's not so much, you know, it's like, yeah, these things do take time. Uh, but particularly if you want to do them well. You know, that's the real key is yeah. like, you know, you can release... You can cut corners and poop all, something out. In, in every and way shit. you can, and you can do these things really quickly, and they will inevitably come out very poorly. And we've learned from those, yeah. you know, like we've you know, just learned that the hard way. Um, and, you know, it is trying to... It's that Rubik's Cube, man. You've got to try and get all those faces matching. Um, and, and that means a lot of hard work and sacrifice. 
Um, but yeah, and I think this is a good topic to, to, to go into because um, Sundance Film Festival is on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of the premier festival for emerging filmmakers emerging talent you know it's it's was founded you know 30 40 years ago by robert redford and it's this big institution you know if your film gets into sun sundance you you're seen you know it's a big deal um and anyway one of the films at that premiered at sundance which was called tangerine um was shot entirely on the iphone 5s right which is um, what i was what i've got and it was sold uh, for high six figures. So right. let's just guess 700,000 US, mm-hmm. which is good because it probably cost uh, maybe 150 or 100. Yeah. But I, I, I did want to point out because this is kind of like one of those really misleading headlines, you know, entire film shot, yeah. iPhone 5S. And yeah. it's like... What about that? That didn't mean there was no cast, yeah. you know, or massive bits of gear involved. And exactly. And, and, and yeah, and like, that's the thing. Like, just to, to... So, one, they had a special adapter, which is about $180 US, uh, that they put on the iPhone yeah. to make it look more filmic and allows them to control the uh, focus and all that sort of stuff. Plus an app that they... Which was only $20, which you know lets you color balance and all that stuff on your iphone yeah um, manipulate the camera a bit more they also had a steady cam now steady yeah. cams are not cheap and they had a steady cam the whole time because you know the iphone shakes if you're just holding it it's yeah. very very jittery yeah um but and then they also had a whole sound crew so quickly presumably they had some lenses too because you can put lenses on the front of iphones i i looked at one in thailand uh like a fisheye lens yeah. for my iphone uh and considered buying it well, I think they just said this this one adapted lens. Yeah. I don't know if they had more than that one lens or not. Right. But, you know, that lens is like the equivalent of like a 35, which is kind of a generic lens that can shoot like, you know, you shoot close-ups and you shoot wides with it. Yeah. And it's quite good. Um, but I think that, you know, like the key thing to take away from that is not the iPhone thing. It was that they started, they clearly have a really good story and a really good film. And it's a, you know, quite a unique film. Um, apparently it's a, it follows a trans woman on Christmas Eve as they hunt for the Hollywood pimp who left her heart broken. So right off the bat, it's not just like, uh, you know, uh, some, you know, generic film. It's obviously unique. It's different. It's like an interesting new voice. And I think that's probably why it was picked up and has done well. It has nothing to do with what it shot on, but that's not as good a headline. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, as well, obviously, they would have seen the merit in the hook. The hook being it was shot on an iPhone. Like, surely yes. the festival would have seen some Absolutely. merit in, in having that film oh, in. F- oh, it would get a lot sure. of publicity. And, and that is smart, you know. Yeah. It's smart marketing and it's a clever way to do it if you can pull it off. Mm. And I think, but I think that, you know, like... Those kind of like those kind of stories would certainly make a nineteen year old me just pick up my iPhone and go, "Sweet, we're making a movie now, guys." Yeah, uh, and thinking that just by me pressing record on my iPhone, I was going to get the same sort of result. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which you won't. So right. you still have to have all the gear. But having said that, you know, shooting on that iPhone, they would have been saving a, a huge amount on their camera hire mm. alone. Mm. So you know, it's it, there's nothing wrong with it, but I mean, just you know, be be prepared. Yeah. Now, be a fucking pain in the ass though, because how much <laughs> like memory is on an iPhone? Like you had to be changing cards, like changing. Yeah. I mean, you can't even. It well, doesn't, how, an how, iPhone how, doesn't even have uh, extra memory that you can build in. I don't think. Like, but you, you can't can, put you, a card in like a Samsung. No, but you can get a bigger one, right? Yeah, I guess. But I don't know how big. The bigger right. uh, thirty two. So you get a thirty two. Yeah. Maybe it records. And then dump off the footage. Sixty minutes. Yeah, and then you know that's actually well probably they also have like multiple iPhones as well. They yeah. probably had a whole bunch of them, and also it would take very a very short amount of time at lunchtime to put all that footage on hard drive and start again. Yeah, um, so yeah, uh, but I just thought that was quite an interesting uh, uh, topic. Uh, uh, now we've had some feedback had some feedback so we have had some people uh, listening, to, listening the show. to the podcast so <laughs> thank you very much to you guys that's uh we really appreciate that so we've had um two people uh suggest topics for the show right so the first is from shane simpson 
Yep. Hello, Shane. Thanks for listening. Uh, he sent us an article. Uh, Scientists say smelling farts pre- prevents cancer. Um, and he wanted to know our thoughts on this. Right. Now, uh, so what's, well, the, yeah, the, what's the, what's the uh, science behind that? Well, uh, you know, I mean, it, it says here that although hydrogen sulfide gas, gas is, uh, which is produced when bacteria breaks down, is well known as a pungent, foul-smelling gas in rotten eggs and flatulence, it is naturally <laughs> produced in the body and could in fact be a healthcare hero with significant implications for future therapies for a variety of diseases including cancer and yesterday I had a vegetarian burger down at the Thirsty Dog on K Road yeah. and let me tell you Angie my girlfriend definitely doesn't have cancer now <laughs> <laughs> If this science is to be believed, because last night I was out of control, man. I was so tired, I, but I really should have gotten up and gone to the toilet. <laughs> but instead, you just decided to keep uh, I just, farting. Yeah, I just let it. I just let it happen. She's been back three days. Yeah, she's been back. She was away for two months and, uh, overseas, uh, and a month in America, a month in Colombia, and now she's back three days later. And three days in, you gassed her. Yeah, yeah. Well, she should be thankful, though, according to this article. That's she should true. be grateful. Did you read her the article? Did you bring this article up? Uh, no, I'll just, I'll just give her the podcast. She can listen. All right. <laughs> well, look, I mean, to be honest, you know, like, what is wrong with you if you don't smell your own farts? Yeah. Um, what is wrong with you? Come on, yeah. we all do it. We you all just, do it. You've got to know to think. What, what's happened. Yeah. You got to assess the damage. damage exactly. Well, you know, it's it's it's, it's you know it's uh, it's recon really as well because you know <laughs> what happens if you go out in public and you're expecting it not to be stinky because you didn't smell your last one and then you stink out like the elevator or something like that. It's embarrassing. <laughs> That's right. So you know, you know you've, you've you have to do it to sort of main like what's the radius that you need to maintain away from other people exactly when these yeah. parts are brewing. Yeah. How what's what's the situation here now? Um, I do have a comment about this article though and that is that it is a symptom of our modern society yes where um you know some scientists somewhere do a little bit of sciencing and they come to some conclusion that you know a gas a naturally occurring gas yeah which happens to occur in farts yeah. but also occurs in other places it's yeah. from bacteria breaking down food right uh, this ha- this may be good uh, at preventing cancer, maybe, but they haven't gone to like human yeah. clinical trials or anything like no. that. At the moment, it's just uh, you know a- a- an idea. It's a it's a hypothesis. Yes, you know, um, and so. That that's really it. That's that's all I've all I've got to so far. But of course, the media jumps on it. They see the opportunity. To, to use the word fart in a headline <laughs> legitimately. And suddenly, this is mainstream news, you know? Yes. Like, it's a very obscure and small study done by a university, yep. and but the media jumps on it. They go, shit, if we use the word fart, everybody's going to read this. Yeah. You know, and, and to be fair, they're, they're right. Right. Um, we're we're talking about it right now because it says fart in the headline. But is this not a symptom of how you know shallow and superficial and fucked our society and, and is? How, how how far wrong we've gone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, yeah. I agree. I think that is a serious problem. Like if you look at li- like sort of the life and style section of any like news newspaper or whatever or magazine as you'll see exactly these types of articles which kind of like inconclusive evidence about something mildly suggests this yeah. thing yeah that's the news so but the problem is people don't just go okay and that, people read the headline pe- and people don't go this is <laughs> there's there's nothing here this no. is nothing they go so I'm just going to go around farting on people yeah, all day no, now. No, there are cancer patients now <laughs> asking people to fart in their yeah. face. You know, like, <laughs> I'm serious, man. The world is full of idiots. Like somebody out there is doing that. And that's quite possible. You know, <laughs> this this headline has you know created a. It's actually dangerous. A, well, yeah, it, it is, and. Um, so no, I'm with you there. I'm 100 uh, percent with you there. Now the other the other uh, uh, person, the other question that we had was from James. Graves, mm-hmm. um, who it wasn't really much of a question, but he just said, I, w- I got a topic for you guys. Yeah. GMOs, that's genetically modified organisms, you know, what do you think of them? Right. Um, now, I, I did a you know a small amount of research. I didn't. Oh, you didn't I did do anything? zero research. Yeah, well, I didn't. I didn't do a lot. Um, but I, I sort of already had a gut instinct on this one. Mm-hmm. I had a, an idea of what side of the coin I was going to be landing anyway. Right. Um, and my research kind of uh, confirmed it, which is that GMOs are a good thing. Right. They are a good thing. Yeah. They feed 
the world you know they are a way of you you uh change the dna of a plant or yep. an organism and you know you get bigger yields from it it's yep. more resistant to um pests and uh, which means you use less pesticide mm. uh and you know you create bigger crops and more people get fed basically yes. uh which is which is what i already kind of thought anyway right. and i think it's very easy for people to jump on this like anti-gmo uh bandwagon where they're they're essentially kind of just like fear-mongering and like oh well it's unnatural and it's like fuck man like <laughs> do you know how much unnatural shit we're doing all day every we're, day our entire lifestyle is unnatural 100 percent unnatural everything we do is unnatural you know yeah. like, like it's ridiculous <laughs> you know like especially in the bedroom <laughs> yes. oh, yeah we weren't doing that when we were back when we were monkeys you know we weren't doing those things <laughs> oh well maybe that's us <laughs> <laughs> not together <though. laughs> um so so yes uh my thought thoughts are that uh genetically mod- modified organisms are a good thing right uh, you know we need them we need to feed people uh and you know don't don't jump on the fair bandwagon you know do Just do yet. fucking you know five do your research, research which and- i haven't done when i'm about to speak my opinion <laughs> on this i haven't done that but i'm saying do your research yeah. before you comment on yeah. this <laughs> well do your research before you go um you know getting getting all, uh, you know, getting out there and getting too opinionated on something yeah. that is actually maybe a very, very good and very important thing, uh, yeah. given that we have six billion people on the earth and yeah. we need to feed them. Well, this blends into some other topics. So I sorry guess. about that, James. So I happen to know is, uh, a, a, is on the other side. Is he, it, but I do find, like, he po- posts quite a lot of articles that I do find quite interesting right. about the, f- the, you know, different food things, but they're more to do with the chemicals and stuff yeah. that are being put into some foods yeah. as opposed to the GMO. See, the GMO thing for me is, uh, you know, I think it's fine. Uh, I think, like, the real problem is we've got too many people in this world and not enough food. You know, that is a legitimate problem that's only going to increase. Well, we've got plenty of food. We're just not distributing it evenly. That's well, the issue. There's enough resources on this planet to feed 6 billion people. Yeah, right now there is. But what I'm saying is we're, like, right on the cusp of not. We're right on the cusp of not having enough food not being able to produce like i this is sort of a book which i read about climate change and stuff like that but that's what they're talking about is like and when climate change really hits suddenly we really won't have enough yeah and and so you know um what do we do and one of the answers is gmos yes and and you know like so i think they are necessary i do think that there is uh just a slight concern of you know like you know you start altering things too much you may make them less nutritious um and also i think that just the idea of you you, because we don't really you know we're just doing these things right we don't necessarily know how uh, you know like how external factors will affect these things so for instance if we devise a new strain of the super fast growing corn or whatever uh which begins to feed everyone then what happens if by doing that by making that modification in its structure we leave it open to a certain type of disease or a certain type of like you know thing like you know the potato famine and all that stuff um where you know you kind of ex- unintentionally expose it to some type of condition which will kill them all and Mm -hmm. but we've already taken it that far and that creates a huge problem for us yeah that's the only way i can see there being a real problem with that in particular but but that is a still a hypothetical yeah that's just hypothetical problem you know as opposed to the real problem we have today which is not enough food food, especially if we were to grow it organically you know we just there's not enough food to feed everybody if we were to grow it organically i will just chip in though on the organic thing because you know like there's a difference because what i think about organic stuff i'm thinking about them not using the chemicals and pesticides and you know like injecting you know these chickens with hormones and stuff like that those are the things i'm thinking are good you know about so organic food is good uh it's just obviously but i don't think gmos are specifically the the problem with non-organic food um but i don't really know jack shit about it yeah. so 
bets really just <laughs> yeah well i'm kind of, I, i'm kind of the, uh, much the same it's not really something i've put a hell of a lot of research into but thanks for that topic james so uh yeah i trust you'll be deleting us uh, seeing <laughs> as we <Post> <laughs> seeing as we um just landed on the opposite side to you <laughs> on that topic <laughs> Um, now I also just, uh, just throw another, another one out here. Facebook went down the other day. Yeah. Now Facebook, uh, I, uh, did hear about this, but yeah. it didn't affect me, which is actually really interesting because yeah. I am You're a Facebook f- feed. Yes, you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm on Facebook 24 seven. I didn't even notice. Yeah. Well, I was quite proud to say I had no clue about it till yeah. I read about it after the fact on Twitter. Because didn't Instagram go down as well? Yeah, Facebook and Instagram went yeah. down at the same time. And everyone right. was like, they were literally saying, hashtag Facebook down, like hashtag like fucking Kennedy down, yeah. you know, like it was yeah. ridiculous. It yeah. was ridiculous. But that's funny. That's, a, that's funny if it's tongue well, in cheek. Facebook, I don't, I would use I don't that know if it was, I don't think it was tongue in cheek. I think it was people really getting quite nervous. Where were they using it on Twitter? Yeah, on Twitter. Right. Yeah, and then afterwards on yeah, Facebook. Right. But yeah, but yeah. but yeah, like I was like, come on, man, Facebook down. <laughs> we got a black hawk down. We got a black hawk down. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I I think that if this affected you, you need to spend less time on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, well, sadly, it didn't affect me. You know, I'm sure I would have had some, you know, hilarious story about how I was stuck on the bus and had to actually talk to people. Well, someone, um, yeah, well, someone said that uh, they were like, Facebook's down, Instagram's down. Just let us go, Twitter, yeah. <laughs> and, and we'll all just go back to being normal people again. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which yeah, I thought it was like yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah. So I would love to see Facebook go down, like for like you know a real extended period of time, probably hacked, and just yeah, be essentially taken down for like a month. They just can't get it down for a month and just see what people do or don't do. Well, not me, man. I love Facebook. <laughs> I think it's awesome. Um, well, uh, well, we're running a little bit long we are, today. We've, we've gone quite long here. But that's okay. Yeah, well, I mean... Got a bit of time. Gold stuff. Well, you got a phone call? Oh, it's the boss. The boss being your girlfriend. The boss being my girlfriend. Not your boss at work. Yeah. No, um, should I... Should I well, delete her. Delete her. <laughs> Oh, well, it's off. Um, yeah. So just to, f- but we 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 couldn't continue on without, or we couldn't wrap it up without one of our favourite new segments, which is the, the troll, troll hole. hole. <laughs> <laughs> now, so so I've got this. Um, being such a Facebook fiend, right? I've I've actually got a marketing, you know, sort of uh, plan here like, yes. with Facebook. I'm I am just on Facebook fucking around a lot of the time, but often I've got an end game. Yeah. And that is I want to drive as much traffic to my personal Facebook page as possible. Not the not the Pigville page, because uh, you know, the algorithm that Facebook uses means that only, you know, a very small percentage of the people who have clicked like on a page actually see the posts from that page. And, you know, they want you to pay to uh, to to enhance it and mm. get more people to see it. Whereas your personal page uh, is still the same. Not everybody sees everything you post but more people seem to see everything you post and I think that if you post something on your personal page and uh, it gets exposed to say 100 people and it gets 20 likes Mm. Then they will then spread it out to two hundred people, yeah. you know, and give it a chance to take off with these more people, you know. So the more likes you get, the better it is, and um, and uh, yeah, your personal page seems to get a lot more traffic yeah. than your fan page, and so um, I'm always trying to you know get more and more people to my personal page, which is essentially just a public page that I'm uh, you know I post our videos on there and other things like that, and so what I do is I go to f- to forums and I go to uh, articles and when I read them and if I can think of some sort of you know, uh, witty or mm. insightful or, uh, you know, um, clever. Well, I was going to say like, um, <laughs> provocative, I guess. Provocative. Common. Right. Um, so what you're basically saying, and this is true, is you're a troll. I can and, be a troll. And right now, and this particular one was a, a 100% troll. <laughs> this was no. you, you were participating in the troll hole as a troll as to a troll. begin with and then getting trolled back. 
uh, getting re-trolled. <laughs> yes. Well, so so the troll hole is basically when people the the troll hole segment is people complaining about us online and or just writing horrible shitty comments things about us online, yeah. uh, and and we read these to you now. Um, so on this particular one, I uh, what I did was I went to an article about American Sniper, which is a movie that's just come out yeah. and done very well in the states. Yeah. About uh, it's about a redneck murderer who uh, <laughs> goes trolling. over to Iraq and murders people that he's never met Snipe, um, snipes them in the money. back he does it for money um, <laughs> because that's what his occupation is he's a soldier um, and so he, he he that's that's what it's about and so I, I scrolled down uh, after reading this article about it um, his name's Chris Kyle uh, and he's dead because he gave uh, a gun to a man with um, post-traumatic stress yep. and uh, he shot him um, very, very uh, full metal jacket-ish yeah it is uh, it is actually of, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so anyway, uh, there was uh, somebody had commented, I'm so proud of our military men and women. They protect our freedoms with their lives um, and, and so on. The sort of, you know, uh, very patriotic stuff uh, to which I replied, they protect your freedom to what? Have petrol in your car? How is going to Iraq and killing people protecting your freedom exactly? Were you not free before the invasion? Uh, that got 88 likes. But that is nothing compared to the, the likes. shit storm. <laughs> you <laughs> found yourself in a desert shit storm <laughs> of trolling back of of people hating on your comment. So 145 <laughs> comments later, right, <laughs> I had all this vitriol spewed towards me online, um, and, and you know some of them were very uh, very upset. We've got um, uh, what have you done for your country? Which is not so bad. 113 likes. 113 likes. Hey, 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 he made a fucking zombie film, okay? (laughs) And amused people. I'm a hero, man. (laughs) Harley Neville, get a life, you POS. What's POS? Piece of shit. Oh, yeah. (laughs) No, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. But then uh, down here... Down here, this is this is uh, this is where it things take a bit getting, of a turn. People people started getting a little bit angry. Uh, Harley Neville, damn! I wish douchebags like you would just get the most severe type of cancer and die slowly. <laughs> Has anyone looked at this douchebag's Facebook page? Troll alert, loser, <laughs> pothead, high-fiving, money-mooching conformist that needs to be addressed physically so he can appreciate what our military has done over the years. You just also, I, I mean, there's a few issues with this. The main one being, though, that he said you were a conformist when you were taking a, a non-conformist <laughs> stance. <laughs> exactly. Also, I'm not going to get cancer because I smell lots of my own farts. And, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and then uh, addressed physically as well. I mean, he's he's essentially saying what like, a, I don't agree with you, so let's assault you. But but what sort of a horrible person would wish cancerous death on, on someone, someone for a for comment an, ex, for for an expression of opinion uh, for, on, for, on a forum for a, a valid comment? Yeah. Um, but you know, there, there's <laughs> just so many. Harley Neville, why don't you go to Iraq? <laughs> Harley Neville, you piece of shit pacifist! You, <laughs> I, I like bet pacif- you wouldn't even fight for your own country. Like, like being a pacifist—that's to me, that's not an it's like not an, an insult. insult. That's a compliment, yeah. if you ask me. Like, that's kind of. But okay, yeah. But you know, so it, just, it so it continues, and it's sort of um. What's interesting about it is I got eighty-eight likes on my comment, yep. which is pretty good. But the other comments got hundreds, yeah, of likes, and some of them were really, really. Uh, you know, just like me. Well, just dumb. Like, um, yeah. you know, like Harley Neville. Sometimes it sounds like you've forgotten. Freedom isn't free. <laughs> Boom. Boom. It's like, it's like, what does that even mean, man? Like, it, you know, like that's just you're just spewing that's, out the party line, yeah, there, man. Yeah, like yeah. you've just regurgitated some crap that you heard heard somewhere. What do you mean, freedom isn't free? Like you guys going to Iraq and. You know, securing the oil for America mm. is not really anything to do with my freedom. No. You know, like, Iraq is not a threat to me. It well, is now, uh, now that you've created all yeah. these extremists. Yeah. But it wasn't a threat to me. And yeah. even now, it's a very, very minor threat. The chances yeah. of me getting blown up are fairly slim. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, I think it's interesting because yeah, you got eighty eight likes. The sort of the co- the, the comments against you get like yeah, 130, 140. I think that is America. That is a uh, 
a little uh, sort of uh, no. James Graves is definitely going to delete us because he's American. <laughs> well, I think it's 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 like an encapsulation of America where you have sort of like a skew of sixty forty. You got forty percent of the people uh, quite reasonable and you know a sort of like will question things and think about things and 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 you know like think just think and then you've got the other ones which is 60 percent of the population which are just so patriotic to the point of uh ignorance but also just so like it's like you so patriotic you can't see the forest for the trees really you just can't you're not even going to make sense of anything you're not going to digest the information that is presented to you you are literally just going to get up in arms and start shooting your gun off at (laughs) whatever you know comes your way such as this fellow greg levine who commented harley neville how about every person we kill is one less towel head in our country flying planes into buildings or planting bombs somewhere? It's like towel yeah, head. Jesus. Come on. Come on, guys. Come on. Man. Come on, America. You can do better. <laughs> it's not just America, though. There's ignorant people everywhere. That, that's true. But I just think that, like, you know, this is the problem that, you know, politicians have in america yeah well, who exactly. try and take like reasonable stances yeah, on these the, types of things the, like the gun six, control 60 percent of the population doesn't agree with you yeah so but it's not because they're right yeah majority shouldn't rule yeah so, they're idiots yeah so it's like so obama is like you know we should have tighter gun control and his thing is vetoed in uh mm. congress and he's like we should be ashamed of ourselves america yeah. and he was like fuck you obama yeah <laughs> we yeah. want to shoot we want people to get shot and die all the time yeah. I, th- I think james is pro guns too just by oh, something right. he posted the other day so, oh, right. I, I actually uh, he's, he's a nice guy we had a big conversation yeah. the other day um, <laughs> and some of the things he posts I agree with but. it's not to say there isn't not reasonable people yeah. but I just think <laughs> that uh, yeah there's, there's, there's definitely some con- concerns um, well uh, that's, that's a good, that's good. That's we, a good. we've covered we've covered filmmaking Politics, arts, science. <laughs> I was going to say science, <laughs> <laughs> hard science. <laughs> um, so I think you know this is a good place to wrap it up. All right, cool. So so we'll end on a poem, just like last week. Two poems, actually. Two poems. Now, who goes first? Well, okay, because I will preface this. You know, your poem you wrote. I wrote Harley yeah. Neville. Now I think that you're a, b- a budding poet. Mm. You know, I think you could be the. Was that that guy that was a real famous New Zealand poet? That James died? K. Baxter. That's the one. I feel like you could be like a young James K. Mm-hmm. Baxter. I get a James K. Baxter mm-hmm. vibe from Harley your poems. P. Nibble. Yeah, I, I'm I'm feeling your poems, and I, I legitimately had this thought the other day, and I, this is going to sound crazy, but I was like, I should tell him that, and I should tell him that he needs to write a poetry anthology. And actually, like, submit it for publishing. Like, he needs to do that. Like, he think he's not very, like, you know, he's very dismissive of himself. But I actually legitimately think he's discovered, like, a completely untapped talent he had no idea about, no concept of, and he's actually really good at something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've hyped up my poem now. <laughs> I know. And, and this is the thing. So, we've got Harley's poem. The future James K. Baxter. Mm-hmm. And then we've got my poem, which is by Rudyard Kipling, uh, who wrote The Jungle Book. Uh, and uh, I think quite a lot of other very uh, famous books. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway... Okay, so you go. Do you, so you want me to do my one first? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll end on a high. <laughs> <laughs> you can compare these two poems. Are they in the same league? You know? <laughs> now, to be fair, this one of this this poem is my favourite poem of all time. And I don't really like poems. Right. And I don't read that many, so this is not... But what I like about this poem is... One, it's it's uh, uh, my granddad recommended this poem to me when I was 16. He said, mm-hmm. look, have you heard of this poem? And he's like, it's kind of about like, you know, being a man and, and what it is to be a man, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Try and be a fucking man, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you little cunt. <laughs> He didn't say he's a very he was rest in peace. He was a very lovely gentleman, and but you know, like, and I I know my dad likes the poem as well. But I think to me this this poem is sums up filmmaking, sums up being a director, sums it up perfectly okay. in, in every way. So, so with if, it. if you want to be a filmmaker, these are some of the things you know. If if you can do these things, you you could become a, a great filmmaker. All right. So this is if. By Rudyard Kipling. Okay. Okay. 
If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you've gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings, and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again at your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you, except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Nice. <laughs> Probably should have done my poem first. The, yeah, uh, what do you got for us? <laughs> <laughs> Probably should have done my poem first. <laughs> because uh, this is uh, not quite the same as, as that. <laughs> All right, so my one is called Saturn's Return. You see... Saturn orbits uh, the sun every 29.4 years, and uh, this coincides with the stages of our lives. So I wrote a poem about it. It goes like this. It goes, I was born today, skin smooth as Saturn, youth in front of me, until the return of Saturn. I make my first friends. I fight my first fights. I taste my first kiss. I stay up all night. Saturn's back. I'm 29 now. I still stay up all night, but writing things down. In moments alone, I think of a wife and what it might be like to share in my life. To not live solo, to give a shit, to live for someone else, to raise my own kids. 60 years have passed. Saturn's back where it started. Time flies so fast. Life's not for the faint-hearted. The kids have left home. My parents' souls did depart. I can travel the world now with my sweetheart. I'm 90 today and ready to die. Saturn passes above and brings with it a smile. In memory of the love I knew for a while, I take my last breath and let my soul roam wild. I just need a minute. It's a little emotional. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I look, I actually really love that poem as well. Um, in fact, I was like, yeah, I think I'd probably read that one at my funeral. Mm. Some, I will read that at your funeral. Well, you said I that, and I, and I said, no, you'll be dead first. <laughs> I'll be I'll be living way longer. <laughs> oh, you'll be you way go, in the ground. Just because you eat healthy and go to the gym all the time. Jeez. Uh, well, no, I think you probably eat healthier than me, <laughs> to, to, to be fair. Um, but... Now, just, you know, that that's the depth of Harley Neville. Oof. You really want to, you know. But if you look a little bit further down this list on his next thing, which is not a poem, but almost. But life is a bitch. You've just got to ride her. Enjoy the moment. Play with the fire. Don't save the cigar for when you retire. Because there's nothing there once we expire. Tomorrow we die. The world's looking dire. I'll be down in Mexico. Was that Fernando in La Playa? I'll be there. You're so bad, man. But life is a bitch. You've just got to ride or enjoy the moment. Play with the fire. Don't save that cigar for when you retire. Because there's nothing there once we expire. Tomorrow we die. The world's looking dire. So I'll be down in Mexico fumando in La Playa. All right. Which well, means I'll, I'll be smoking 
you know, the, the implication is that I'm smoking weed on the beach when the world ends. Okay. But that is not actually a poem. That's just a, a that's verse. That's a bit of a I've rhyme, just, yeah. It's just a note that I've kind of, it's a work in progress. So, you know, two, <laughs> two, two different sides to the coin. <laughs> <laughs> that's not so bad. <laughs> So I think we should probably wrap it up. But, yes, but we do say to you guys, um, please uh, send us through some uh, some topics for next week. You got anything you want us to address? We uh, will be here same pl- same time, same place next week. So so send them through to the Facebook page, uh, Pigville Productions, or add me Harley Neville, or you can email Pigville Productions at hotmail dot com if you're one of those old fashioned email people, um, or tweet, or you can tweet at GPZ GPI double z e y or at harley neville and uh yeah so just give us give us some topics guys and we'll uh, we'll make you famous thank you very much we'll catch you next time you've been listening to the guy and harley podcast proudly brought to you by pigville productions laugh it up fuzzball <laughs>